Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I'm absolutely delighted to have the pleasure of interviewing psychotherapist and personal development coach, Tanya Cole Lesnick, who will be speaking to us today from Cortland Manor, New York. Tanya had her first experience with a therapist in her mid twenties when she sought the answer to why her love life wasn't living up to her hopes. And she wanted to understand what was getting in the way. One-on-one therapy was followed up by group therapy that significantly transformed Tanya's life because not only did she meet and marry her husband during that time, but she also made the decision to leave her career as a graphic designer and become a therapist, going on to receive a master's degree in social work from NYU and deciding to dedicate her life to helping others lead lives that they truly love. During her nearly three decades as a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist turned coach, Tanya has run hundreds of groups, and she has found therapeutic groups to be an incredibly powerful way to foster emotional growth. She has now combined her two most powerful tools, group and coaching work, to create her transformational coaching program called Activate. I'm looking forward to talking with Tanya about feeling unlovable before she began working with a therapist, how group therapy changed her relationship with herself, the energetic clutter that keeps people from growth and meaning in their lives, how group work helps people touch on their unconscious issues, her transformational coaching program called Activate, and so much more for an insights-filled interview that can light the path to healing, growth, and new meaning for many of us. And full disclosure, I myself have greatly benefited from both psychotherapy and coaching. I can state without reservation that they have significantly contributed to the full-hearted, joyful place I now happily inhabit in my life. Hey, Tanya, a warm welcome to Grief and Rebirth Podcast. Hi, Irene. I'm so excited to be here and already sort of swept away with this energy, which is amazing. Thank you so much. And let's hope that, and I trust that everyone listening is also going to get swept away because we have so many wonderful, insightful things to tell them about. So just as an introduction to you and, and so we can get them to know who Tanya is, how old were you when you became aware of feeling unlovable and what contributed to those feelings? Yeah, I mean, it multi-layered. I was probably 10-ish, maybe, when I was, you know, tween age and teasing and kids. And I grew up with a mother who struggled a lot with anxiety, and that came out as anger and rage. Mm. And so I think the combination led to me trying to call it right and trying, I mean, I think people pleasing stuff started really early on and feeling like I had to curate, everything had to kind of go through and I had to decide my brain and I had to decide, is that going to present me as cool or not? Not that I thought of it so clearly in those words. So yeah, I think very early on, I had a hint of that. And then as I got older and was interested in meeting boys and then men, I struggled with some of the romantic connections and questioned my lovability even more so at that point. I can really identify with that because you get messages when you're growing up. I did too. 
and uh, mm. they become a part of you until you change them. <laughs> you change that internal dialogue, right? So you want to tell us about the feelings of shame you grappled with when you began one-on-one -on -one therapy to overcome your feelings of unlovability. So not only do you feel unlovable, but now you go into therapy and you're feeling ashamed of the fact that you need therapy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time. I mean, this was more than 30 years ago. And at that time, there was a lot of stigma connected to therapy. I mean, still some, but way better these days. And it was New York City. So that was probably the best place for therapy back in those days. But still, I struggled with thinking two things. One, my problems weren't legitimate enough. And also the fact that I had what felt like big enough problems that I was considering therapy. Both of those felt like I was dismissing myself, but I felt shame. It was really kind of a tricky way of feeling to have to try and navigate it was really an extension of the of the uh low steam that yeah. you were having right yeah. so yeah. how did group therapy change your relationship with yourself and what did your first experience with group therapy teach you about what you call the human experience ah yeah so at first when i finally did decide to go to therapy i went to therapy with this wonderful therapist named bonnie and then the shame really didn't feel so present in the room with her we right away started to share some more intimate stories about my life i was vulnerable and she was lovely and i felt very safe in that space and healing started pretty right away but then she suggested adding group therapy and she did both so she ran the oh she I met with her individually, but she ran the group as well. And that was sort of terrifying, the idea of it, but she encouraged me to go. And so I decided that I would give it a go. I was sort of intrigued too. And I went in and my very first experience was that she did not introduce me to the group. So here's a group that already exists and they were talking to each other and they clearly knew each other. And I felt really uncomfortable and shy. I was shy on a good day. So I felt really uncomfortable and shy. And the leader, Bonnie, did not introduce me. So I sat quietly through almost the whole group. And then finally, towards the end, she said, Tanya, why are you so quiet? And I shared a little, I said hello to people. And it was as if they just noticed I was there, that they hadn't even noticed me before. And as I considered why she didn't introduce me, it occurred to me that she was helping me develop my own voice. And so just this idea that I was going to have to rescue myself in the context of being in this kind of environment. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a tricky lesson to start with, but it also was so powerful. Did she later discuss that with you? Did you ever ask her why she you took know, her time? I'm I'm thinking probably because I did the combination of individual and group. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking probably, but I don't remember for sure if we did. I know that I did sort of process it that way. So she was yeah. trying to get you to empower yourself to speak up. That's right. right. That's right. exactly right. right. Yeah. Right. You, that I had some therapy myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> Please share the story. You made a short documentary. I did. And it's on your website. And how did that inspire you to profess? So you were doing, you, what were you then? And how did this inspire you to professionally go out on your own? Yeah. So I, throughout my career, I've been on my own. At other times, I've worked for other people. And during this time, I was working at a wellness center, doing mostly therapy. We did some retreats. And I loved my boss, but... When I was making the documentary, I literally, and this is like your story, I literally heard a little voice that said, huh, I think it's time for you to go out on your own. And honestly, the job I had at the time was my dream job. I, I was not feeling happy in that work situation, but there was something about expressing myself creatively as I was making this documentary that touched my heart in a way that really I hadn't been sort of at connecting to my heart in that way as I was working for somebody else because it it was still else's voice even though it was sort of my voice but um and it helped me just have that experience again of connecting to my voice and when I heard that little 
suggestion, maybe it's time. It re I couldn't unring that bell. No, um, that's what that. happens. You pay attention. It. It's not your voice. Yeah. Uh, what was the doc? What prompted the documentary? Who asked you to make it? Um, I decided I wanted to do it. it was oh, you did it on your yeah. own. Even though I was working for somebody else, I always love doing group work and people are afraid of groups so often. And I think in my mind, it was like, I just want to make something that could help people understand, get to know me a little bit, trust me a little bit, and perhaps feel brave enough to consider group. And um, I had uh, my daughter's friend was a cinematographer and I used to have a professional video. So it was like one thing led to another, had a couple of conversations and then that creative part of me started to beautiful revved up. Good for you. And now you've got decided to go out on your own and you had to handle people pleasing issues that got triggered. And I know in our audience, there are people who are listening who have people pleasing issues. And you had also you know, activation of your nervous system. I know everyone can relate to that. And you had to learn to reconnect to the more creative parts of yourself. So could you tell us a little bit about this journey? Yeah. So people pleasing is just something I always gravitated towards. It is like what I shared with you about when I was a child and started to do some of that. And for a long time, didn't even understand that people pleasing was a way of abandoning myself. I think at the time I thought, oh, I'm a nice person. I just like to be nice to other people. And as I got more in the work that I do and understanding that, I was able to start recognizing oh, this is something that comes up for me and it's uncomfortable if I don't honor sort of what feels like my way of being nice to other people, but I abandon myself. And so as I'm learning about it and able to start setting more boundaries for myself and able to recognize that to check in with myself is a really important part of my own process, um, so that was something I was learning to do, but it can be more potent at times. So as I'm deciding I'm going to leave this job that I love, where people are really depending on me in this job situation, I was like a director of client programs. I so had now you have guilt on top of everything else. That's exactly <laughs> right. So my guilt is coming up, the people pleasing. And so even though I had this thought that was connected to my heart, maybe it's time to go on your own. I had, as I started the process, I was like, oh, how can I leave them? They really need me right now. Somebody else had left close to that same time. And so it was terrible timing. And so I heard myself saying, oh, maybe I should just stay a little while longer. It's not good timing. And realize, oh, there's that people pleasing thing. And it's really important that I honor myself here. And so it was interesting conversation. And my boss was so aware of limiting beliefs and those kinds of ideas. And he knew that she would support me through it, even though she was in a more difficult situation because I was deciding to leave. So it was definitely a complicated thing, but I knew that I needed to go through the discomfort to get to a place where I was really honoring that calling from my heart. So and also, I have to say, your boss was a tremendous role model for you because she, in spite of it hurting her in certain ways, she was emotionally mature enough to understand That's and to right. let and go and bless your journey, which is That's tremendous, right? Right? Yeah. right. And actually, I run retreats with her now. So, you know, we kind of came full circle and found something else, which you never know if you don't start you to don't. follow your heart. You don't know what's in ahead for you. That's right. Well, we don't know, but there is a plan, <laughs> right? Tell everyone in the way, what ways the therapeutic groups are an incredibly powerful way to foster emotional growth. If someone is thinking, mm, do I go to individual therapy or should I get into group therapy? Yeah. Why group therapy? Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing about group is that when you're connecting to other people on their personal growth journeys, it helps you 
touch on your own humanity because you can see yourself reflected in other people. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in my group is what's resonating for you as you're sort of hearing each other share your own personal journeys. And we pay very close attention to all the overlap. And so I think that knowing you're not alone, touching on things that you didn't bring into the room that day. You weren't necessarily coming into the group saying, oh, I've got this particular issue that I want to talk about. I mean, you might have been, but there are things that come up when other people talk that it helps you learn a little bit more about your own layers. And that can be really helpful and touch on some unconscious things. So there's that. There's the fact people start to get to know you. And so as we're talking with each other about our journeys, we celebrate when somebody is really taking some steps that we know are hard, even if they're tiny, we talk about how huge even the tiny steps are. So there's a lot of celebration. There's a lot of reflecting back. So as we know each other and we see each other grow, we can say things to each other like, oh my gosh, you've come such a long way. Your energy is so different. And so maybe somebody used to be much more uptight and they're starting to relax and be calmer and we can see it, it's palpable. And so that can be really powerful. It's a tremendous validation of their work yeah. and how they're changing and improving. So for those who are going, hmm, am I a candidate for group therapy? What would you call identifiers for people to think about if they uh, that would indicate that it could be helpful to them? I think when somebody's done some therapy and they have identified their stories and they hear themselves knowing the content, but change is starting to feel a little bit tricky for them to make, then group can be something where there's just a little bit more information coming up because you're like what I was sharing with you earlier about some of that unconscious stuff. So that can be really helpful. Somebody's already done some work, so they're not as raw because I think if somebody's going through a healing process and they're very early on in the healing process, group is probably going to be a little bit more difficult to start with. So individual and getting to know your the um sort of that, that you carry can be really a great place to start and then group when you have more awareness of what your things are group can be a way to touch on things that are a little tricky to touch on when you're an individual i mean i so relate to it not only for my own self but my husband was in group therapy for years tanya um he had a very difficult experience he had to get custody of his children and all of this and he he got he, as he was working with suggested he get into group therapy and he used to call them his committee he exactly. would meet with yeah. them once a week and he'd say he couldn't wait to see them and to talk and, and to put them back and and, and give him all of that kind of thing it really helped him with what yeah. he needed to face so the other thing you talk about is energetic clutter mm. clearing energetic clutter and how it keeps people from growth and meaning in their lives. So would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. So that actually is something that came up literally while I was cleaning out my kitchen cabinets and connecting sort of the idea of I was going through spices and there were some really old spices in there and just seeing they were taking up space. They weren't useful anymore. I was never going to use them. They were taking up space and kind of clogging up um, the cabinets. And so I realized, oh yeah, we do that with energy too. When we don't look at what we're carrying around sometimes, our energy is getting depleted by certain things that are not serving us, that are not even our truth anymore. And so what I define as energetic clutter, those are all the things that demand our attention, our time, our energy, but they're not helping us move the needle towards growth or meaning or how we wanna feel. And so if we go back to the people pleasing as an example of that, it could be 
you know, as I'm abandoning myself and pleasing others, it's very depleting. And so I'm engaged in this behavior and this pattern where I'm getting depleted. I want more in my life, but I'm exhausted because I'm so busy pleasing other people. And so that's an example. There's lots of limiting beliefs that we can carry around. And really it's the pairing of limiting beliefs and the behaviors that go along with them. But when we're automatic and just keep going and don't question some of these beliefs that we've been carrying around, it can take up so much space that we're not able to connect to our hearts in a way that's going to be much more meaningful and satisfying for us. I kind of liken it to carrying a backpack with you that's loaded with stuff that you don't need. That's right. Yep. And when you do all this healing and you drop the backpack, it's, it's changes your life. Yeah. It, you yeah. know, for the better. So I know you have this wonderful coaching program, this transformational coaching program called Activate that allows people to access deeper and even unconscious issues through hearing the stories and experiences of others. Can you talk about Activate and some of those powerful factors that influence our lives? Yes. So, so Activate is really a combination like what my experience was when I had a combination of individual and group to help me grow on my personal growth journey. And I've had other times in my life when I've connected to either coaches or groups, that kind of thing. Um, I offer a combination often, like I said, often people feel a little afraid to start with group. And so most people come first individually, and that gives us an opportunity to get to know each other, to start to identify what some of the energetic clutter somebody might be carrying around with them might be and get start to get clear on what the work might look like and when somebody's ready and this is a combina a conversation that's ongoing and we keep talking about that we'll add group therapy into it or group coaching into it and my group runs every other week and then so if somebody starts with individual, often they'll go individual and group together for a little while. And then when they're feeling ready, then we'll remove the individual and it'll just be group that continues on. And so when somebody is new to group, the individual is really helpful to process what came up during group that maybe they didn't feel ready yet to share within the group mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm and that we can talk it through. So not only is the person sharing some of their experiences with me, but we've also now had a shared experience. And one of the things as a private clinician where you're only seeing one person at a time, they'll tell you about their lives and what goes on for them socially, but you don't always have the opportunity to see it. And so that's really powerful as well for me to be able to experience somebody in a group situation, somebody responding in a group situation, and to hear later what was going on in their insides as they were having this experience. And so it's a really powerful healing thing. We decide together what would be helpful to bring back to group, what would be helpful to share with the group, what do you feel you'd rather keep privately, and we kind of just go through some of those questions while somebody's on their journey. And so it's in that combination of the two together where I think it can be such a, a powerful part of transformation. Sounds very dynamic. Yes. Do yeah. you have a story to share with us about someone who's really benefited from your Activate program? Yeah. Like an example? Yeah. So I have a client who comes to mind who really struggled a lot with overdoing, like brilliant, amazing, really doing well in her career, a mom volunteering on top, like doing tons of things and amazing at it all, but also overdoing and exhausted. And so her way of responding to the feeling of being exhausted was alcohol mm -hmm. and losing her temper. And so she had this cycling of really over-functioning, doing amazingly well, people always saying things to her like, oh my God, I don't know how you do it all. And then 
at the end of it, she would really struggle with it, struggle with some of the self-care stuff because there were too many things on her plate. She was trying to get too many things done and taken care of. And so through our process, she was able to start to identify the limiting belief and the, the associated behavior. So the energetic clutter of this overdoing thing. So she had this connection to her worth being connected to how much she does. And so for a long time, that drove her behavior. And when she was able to start recognizing that the overdoing was directly related to the drinking and the losing the temper and starting to be able to name that, get some feedback from other people in group around that, it started to release. Like she, it didn't have such a strong pull on her anymore. It was no longer her automatic behavior. It didn't mean it didn't come up from time to time, but she was able to, she, with the drinking, sometimes she stopped completely. Other times she explored, could she be somewhere in the middle with that? and also learned her own triggers for the anger, got really good at taking better care of herself, going for walks, taking baths, Fantastic. going down, and just energetically even when she would, you know, the groups are done virtually and in the Zoom room. And so there was always this sense when she would hop on that there was some intensity and there was an edge often when she was really in it. And as she was starting to work through it, that you, we could just felt, have her hop on. There was a lot more calmness and ability to not get sort of sucked into some of this old dynamics that really would get her emotion. Right. The, also, the beauty of group, especially when I think it's guided by someone like you, is that there's no judgment. Yeah. If there's absolutely no judgment. I think that judgment is something that people are afraid of becoming a part of a group like that because they're afraid they're going to be judged. Yes. And right. And there's a tremendous amount of acceptance and lack of judgment in these groups, which fosters growth. Yeah. Yeah. Right? For yeah. Sure. Saying that, give us a description of your virtual individual and group coaching, your in-person weekend retreats, mm. your transformational intensives and what else would you like us to know about yeah so uh individual really is a very customized process and people come in and they start to talk about what they want to work on and what some of the struggles have been and we usually start with that and then i often talk to people about where do they want to put their energy at during the time between our sessions. So sometimes I'll meet with somebody weekly, sometimes I'll meet with them every other week, and they'll work on some things in between and we'll talk about that. And at the moment, I'm in process of developing an app to help people as a tool just to stay connected to their personal growth journeys, because there can be a little bit of vagueness of, okay, I'm leaving the session, I'm going to be focusing on my people pleasing behaviors, but it's very easy to kind of get swallowed back up into day to day life and lose sight of some of that. And so people work on some of their things. And then when they come to group, uh, I offer a topic to people once they start group, they get a topic between sessions. So group is every other week, I run small groups, um, you know, it could be anywhere from three to 10 people in a group and we'll talk about what's been going on. We catch each other up, but there's always a topic that I've asked people to think about for a week. So groups every other week, but I'll send them the topic between weeks. So the most recent topic was actually about faith. How do you have faith in your personal growth journey and that some of where you're putting your energy and attention how do you know it's the right place and we just talk about what came up for people and we catch each other up about where they are and we pay attention to what's resonating for each other and so we respond to that and so that's what I do with group um some people, as I said, kind of stop doing the individual. Some people just do it as needed. If there's something that came up that they want to process separately, then they can reach out to me. And so it, it doesn't have to be real rigid. Um, and then the uh, retreats are like my 
favorite. I always think of retreats as kind of group on steroids. And we're doing one um, with my my boss, the one that I mentioned, who used to be my boss. She's going to love that you mentioned her during this interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, she and I run these um, retreats together. We call them deep reset retreats. And we really help people very deliberately release some of the things that they are identifying, some of this energetic clutter. And uh, we work on releasing some of those and then starting to create and build, well, what do you want for yourself? What what speaks to your heart? What lights you up and help people in that process start to create that picture for themselves and to hear from each other. And during that time, these retreats are two full days. We fall in love with each other. I mean, it's of such course. a it's an experience. And then a lot of people redo them. So as we continue to offer the retreats, they come back. And so that's amazing as well to be able to see people on their journeys or some people I'll work with and then they come to the retreat. So being able to be together on all these different layers helps us really connect in such a Marvelous. deep way. Now you do this, the, the retreats are, are at a physical locale, right? Where we, most of your work is online. That's right? right. That's right. They're in person. And so the rest of the work I do online, yes, virtually, but the the deep reset we've been doing for the past, this is will be our third coming up in October, October 24. Um, we do them at this farm, this beautiful Cold Spring, New York. It's like an old farmhouse on the property. We get the property to ourselves and it's a beautiful old building and we love it. I mean, it feels very magical. And the two that we've done there already, both times that we've driven up these windy roads to get there have been really foggy. And so as we're going through our releasing part, it's been really foggy. And then as we're kind of getting through that part, the sun comes out. I mean, it just oh, so happens. Yeah. Well, wow. Someone's pulling for there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Tanya, you help your clients to heal, transform, and to build the lives they're really excited, genuinely excited to be living. Why do you need to go through what you need to go through and face? Why is it worth it to heal yeah. that stuff? Yeah. I think when you don't, there's such an experience of, eh, is this all there is? I think it's hard for people to feel satisfied with their lives and feel connected to other people and feel like they're honoring themselves and their hearts and their energy levels. When we don't do that, we can be an automatic pilot and struggling to really feel enjoyment and joy and peace in our lives. And so I think that the healing is such an important way to enjoy our time on this. I planet. kind of think of it as a way to set yourself free. Yeah. <laughs> right. I right. Love that. From a yes. lot from sure. pulling yeah. you down. And you have an offer for the members of our audience today? I do. I offer a finite discovery session which can be scheduled um, right on my website if somebody wants to do that, or you can reach out to me through the website. You can find um, my email if you would rather reach out, but you can schedule it yourself. And I would love to talk to anybody who's just considering whether they might want to explore group or activate. Yeah, We'll have all your information through everything so people yeah. can reach out to you. And how do you help a person identify what truly makes her soul light up and get her back into alignment so she can experience joy yeah. and peace? And what is your personal tip for finding joy in life? Uh, yeah, I think what I talk so much about is getting quiet so that you can connect to your heart and your intuition. When we're so busy and we're caught in sort of that, the hamster wheel and go, 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 or, or opposite of that and just crashing, then we're losing sight of what goes on in our hearts. And so to create space where you can connect to your heart, notice what bubbles up, notice what's starting to speak to you. And when you can then take some of those steps. So you're noticing your heart, you're taking steps and then notice what continues to come up as you're taking some of these action steps. 
When are you excited? When are you feeling lost because you're in a state of flow and it's amazing? When are you feeling really disconnected and kind of about what you're doing and really starting to pay attention to those layers? And that will bring you joy. Yeah. And that will bring you joy. You know, Tanya, in closing, I love this testimonial about you and your work for Martha Beck, mm -hmm. who is a best-selling author and regular contributor to OprahDaily.com. And she says, Tanya uses a one-of-a-kind combination of experience, intuition, personal warmth, and intellect to liberate clients from self-defeating ideas, habits, and life situations. Mm -hmm. For almost three decades of counseling and coaching experience, Tanya has developed an array of instincts and skills that are targeted and very powerful. Her personality as everyone can see, invites people to open up. And when they do, Tanya knows just how to seize that moment and create positive changes. She makes an excellent guide and traveling companion for anyone who wants to change from the inside out. Tanya, my heartfelt thanks for all you are doing to help people move forward in their lives to have lives filled with peace, joy, and meaning. And for this insights-filled interview that has surely lit the path to healing, growth, and new meaning for so many in our Grief and Rebirth podcast audience. And here is a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts, especially and in including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Mm. Thank you again, Tanya. Uh, Many blessings. And bye great. for now. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. Thank you. It's so great to know you. And we're almost neighbors. You're, you're a New York girl. I'm a New Jersey girl. Yes. As I like to say, to be continued. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.